Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Um, we are on to the last one of our astrobiology webinar, as far as we know. Today's presentation is how we can search for life in our solar systems, being led on cable. Uh, the video from uh, yesterday's webinar, Steve Moises, uh, will be up in the next couple of days, and that will be added to our YouTube stream. The slides for today's presentation will be added to the event link, uh, and that will be up in the next hour or so. And finally, this session is being recorded, and that covers both uh, anything that's said and anything that's typed in the public chat window, and that there obviously becomes publicly available. And with that, Morgan. Thank you very much, Andy. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. So my name is Morgan Cable. I am a, a staff scientist here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and a part of my research involves astrobiology and the search for life. And I'm, I'm very happy to be here today and to tell you a little bit about how we search for life or how we would like to search for life and get your feedback on it. So with that, I'd like to start off first with a question for all of you. There are plenty of targets astrobiologically in our solar system, and NASA has certain ideas of which would be the best, which is the easiest to get to, um, which has the greatest potential for us to find life. And so I wanted to start off with some votes, some input from you of where you think the best potential for life might be in our solar system. So if you look on your screen, you should have some options for uh, selecting Mars, Europa, Titan, Enceladus, or uh, some other targets like Triton, which is a moon around Neptune, for example. Uh, so if you want to take a few brief moments to, to make a vote there, it looks right now that uh, Europa is one of the main, main contenders with Enceladus in second place. Okay, good. So, so you're on a similar page uh, as NASA, which is, which is exciting, but any time that we we disagree or, or we have um, different opinions from the community, we're always very interested. Uh, Max has a question about extant or extinct life. That's a very good question. We'll get into that a little bit uh, in terms of what kind of biomarkers we should target. I would say whichever has the best potential, Max. So if you think we have a greater chance of finding extinct life on Mars versus extant life on Europa, that would be something to consider. Oh, and someone just changed their vote. <laughs> okay, so, so let's uh, move forward then. I'm just going to give a brief intro for those who don't uh, live and breathe this stuff on some of these major targets. So let's go to the next slide here. So let's just start off with the places where we would like to look for life. Uh, Europa, of course, as that poll showed, is one of our main uh, targets for this. It's one of the moons around Jupiter, it has an icy shell, has hydrated minerals and um, sulfur dioxide and a few other things on its surface. And more importantly, it's got a subsurface liquid water ocean. Uh, I believe the volume of this ocean is somewhere around three times greater than the volume of all Earth's oceans combined. And because of this uh, tidal flexing that happens, due to the gravitational forces of Jupiter and the other Galilean moons kind of doing tug of war on each other, there could be a potential hydrothermal activity where the subsurface ocean meets the, um, the silicate crust of, of the interior of Europa. And so because of that, we're very interested in looking for life that has analogs on Earth at the bottom of our oceans uh, around hydrothermal vents. These are communities where Hydrothermal fluid, which is, is hot fluid, has a lot of dissolved uh, minerals and gases and, and even some organics, and it mixes with the, the cold uh, ocean water, and you end up forming these, these really intricate chimney structures because precipita precipitation happens, right, because you've got a thermal gradient. You also have a whole bunch of other energy gradients that life can use to survive. You've got redox, uh, like I mentioned, thermal, a whole bunch of chemical gradients of uh, concentration gradients moving along that life can take advantage of. So despite the fact that there's no sunlight, we're talking, you know, 3,000 meters below the, the surface of the ocean, uh, we find these thriving communities. They have both um, microorganisms kind of life and also uh, macro flora and fauna. And so these types of communities may be something that could exist in a place like Europa. 
So let's see, what do we have next? We have Mars next. Uh, so, of course, Mars is, is dry, more of a desert uh, nowadays, but it did have a, a much warmer, wetter history. And, in fact, recent evidence, I uh, believe from MRO, but I could be wrong, detected these, uh, these lineae that might be uh, liquid water events occurring on the surface even today. So Mars may have the potential, it may have had in the past, to have life and may still today, especially if that life is very robust to things like uh, high salt or very low water activity. So a good Earth analog for Mars is, among others, is the Atacama Desert in northern Chile, which is the driest desert in the world. So it has very low water activity, but um, many teams at JPL, other NASA centers, use this as an analog for Mars. Uh, in fact, I've been on an expedition there and we found all sorts of life. It's not evident, but a lot of microbial life, halophilic organisms, so things that can tolerate high salt, um, and bacterial spores, which are the toughest form of life we know about. Uh, so there are plenty of, of organisms that can even survive in, in this type of extreme environment. So I'm looking at a question or a comment from Steve. Let's see. Tides give us reason to believe there may be extensive hydrothermalism. Ooh, okay, that's a good comment. Uh, we may bring that up. Oh, feel free to interrupt with questions at any point. This is supposed to be uh, more of an informal format, and I'd like to, to make this as interactive as possible. I'm going to keep going, but feel free to interrupt at any time, especially if, if you have comments that are immediately to apply to what I'm talking about. Okay, so next is uh, one of the moons of Saturn. That's, it's pretty near and dear to my heart. I've done some, some research on this. Titan. So Titan is is one of the, the larger moons in our solar system. I think it's the second largest, although if you count the atmosphere with the diameter, technically the biggest, um, it's got a, a thick atmosphere, thicker than Earth, uh, about 1.5 bar at the surface, and, and Earth, our surface is around one bar, so it's thicker than Earth, and it's composed of nitrogen and methane, and uh, charged particles from Saturn's magnetosphere, <coughs> excuse me, and UV radiation and various other things break up this nitrogen and methane, and form a whole bunch of different organic compounds, uh, the HCN, for example, and, and much, much larger species as well. And these combine and react. They form these haze layers that we see in the atmosphere, and then they rain down on the surface. So Titan is a, a very unique mix. It's got a, a water ice shell, but it's coated in this veneer of organics, and we're not sure how thick that layer is, but there's, there's a lot of stuff there. And Underneath all of that, it also has a subsurface liquid water ocean, just like Europa and a lot of the other icy worlds. Um, in addition to that, it's got hydrocarbon lakes, which is pretty cool, at the poles, so uh, mostly uh, methane, ethane uh, lakes. And like I said, it's got this huge inventory of organic molecules. So all of the ingredients for life are there, uh, but it's very cold. The surface is around 90 Kelvin, so there are questions about the thermodynamics involved uh, for a lot of organic chemistry reactions that might be necessary uh, for life. But it's still a really interesting place. Uh, we don't really have a good analog for Titan on Earth, although plenty of Titan chambers have been built to simulate Titan's environment and try to, to understand more about these organics that are formed in the atmosphere. But in terms of life, the closest analog that I can think of and that's been brought up in the literature before is uh, hydrocarbon metabolizing bacteria. So an example of this could be Pitch Lake, which I've shown here at Trinidad and Tobago, although this uh, temperature regime is much higher. The organisms that exist in this type of environment, they're referred to as poly-extremophiles sometimes because they um, tend to have many qualities that sometimes only a single extremophile will have, for example, resistance to either high or low temperature, um, an absence or near absence of, of liquid water, instead having nonpolar media, um, and in many cases being exposed to, to radiation and various other things like that. Another example could be some of these deep sea oil drilling sites, um, which also seem to have uh, incredible amounts of bacterial life that can survive in those situations. So although life on Titan might, uh, if, if there is any, could be a little bit more in the, on the exotic side, compared to life on Earth, there are still potentials. And that's something that we shouldn't, um, that we should consider when we're talking about astrobiology. Okay, 
last but not least, Enceladus, another moon around Saturn. Uh, this one's a bit further out and a bit smaller, but it's pretty exciting, especially from an astrobiological standpoint, because it's spewing ice and uh, and um, the water ice and I think a few other materials out of its south pole, out of these tiger stripes. So it's basically just giving us samples <laughs> from the interior, which is usually very difficult to access. Uh, so because of this, Enceladus may be a, a very interesting target for us um, in terms of some of the more difficult aspects of investigating astrobiology, trying to collect a sample um, can be really challenging. So Enceladus, just like Europa, Titan, and many other of the icy moons, has a subsurface liquid water ocean. Uh, and Steve can, can correct me on this. I think he knows a bit more about the, the size of these oceans and, and things of that nature. But a good Earth an analog, of course, would be something like Antarctica, some of these subglacial ecosystems, where you have liquid water, it's very cold, and we still have plenty of organisms that can survive, at least on Earth, in these types of environments. They tend to be psychrophilic, which means cold-loving, or halophilic, so they like high saline environments. And as this image shows, this is from a, a drill site in Antarctica a core. You can even see some higher life forms, like this, this little shrimpy guy here. So uh, those are a few of the astrobiology targets that NASA really considers when it comes to um, looking for life in the solar system. Uh, at this point, it might be informative to go back to that question we had before where you were voting and ranking on where you think the greatest potential exists for life. So, Mike, can you pull that up again? Let's see if anyone has changed. We've got, let's see, Europa still in the lead, and we've got one vote for Mars and one for Enceladus. No votes for Titan. What about the subsurface ocean of Titan, guys? You could have organics, maybe if there's some kind of exchange. I know cryovolcanism isn't really as hot of a topic right now, but there is still potential, especially if you have ammonia that could interact, um, that could change buoyancy and, and potentially spill out on the surface of Titan. Well, there are a lot of, of interesting theories going on, but I suppose until we have solid proof, I'm okay with that. So, so a few votes have changed. It looks like Enceladus now has beat out Mars in terms of potential for life. Okay, so, so we've got a little bit of feedback. That's good. Uh, let's keep going. Um, Mike, can you close that down? Because I've got some quite a bit of text on the next couple of slides. All right, so I was thinking about how we search for life and kind of the best way to break it down. And I thought to split it up in terms of the platform seemed pretty reasonable. So I'm going to talk about each of these in turn. So... First, there's remote observation, right? Uh, looking at the planet from orbit or via flyby or using a, a telescope or something uh, from Earth. And remote observation has a lot of advantages. For example, you can study a, a really large surface area. In fact, you can get global coverage uh, with a lot of these orbiters that we have today. And you can study effects globally. You can look for things mm -hmm. like hot spots um, and get a, a much better idea of where life might exist on a body like Europa or Mars or something like that. There are a few drawbacks. Uh, for example, resolution compared to if you had uh, an imager in situ obviously is not going to be as good. Uh, and limits of detection, especially when you're looking at things like, um, like methane gas release, things like that, uh, aren't quite as good as they would be in situ. But you do get the global coverage, so there's a trade-off there. The second platform, instead of looking at things remotely is to get down in the environment where you're trying to look for life. And you can do this with a lander, a rover, maybe even people, to be really nice uh, to do more of that. And there are lots of benefits, right? You can um, take images with much, much higher resolution, your limits of detection, which vary a lot by technique, but they tend to be much better. Uh, but you do have a few drawbacks. You can't sample everywhere. Right? You can only send a lander to a very specific place, and usually the scientists and the engineers tend to argue about where to go. Right, The, the engineers want to go to the safe places, the scientists want to go to the interesting places, and it's very rare that those two actually tend to coincide. So there is some risk in terms of the, the engineering side that you have to consider. There's also the issue of contamination, 
which is inherent anytime you're in the environment you're trying to study. And the best way to mitigate that is to just be very careful and thorough from a scientific standpoint that you're running the right controls, that you're sure of the data you're collecting and um, and just making making it very clear to the scientific community when you report your results. So that's in situ. Um, the last life detection strategy, which we're, we're getting to hopefully with Mars uh, in the near future, is sample return. So getting a sample, collecting it, bringing it back. Uh, of course, the benefits here are then you have any technique on the planet Earth that you can use to, to analyze these, even if it takes up an entire room or an entire building, because you don't have to worry about flying it. So you can get ultra-sensitive uh, limits of detection. Uh, you, can, you can run analyses multiple times. You don't have to worry quite so much about, um, about some of the things that, that you need to in terms of in situ, in terms of, of power, uh, mass constraints, and so your sensitivity can be improved. Uh, there are drawbacks, of course. It's really, really ridiculously expensive. There's also a question of sample preservation. Current uh, models for sample return involve having these sealed samples sitting on Mars for a while before they're brought back up, and whether that thermal cycling could do anything to the organisms, if there are any there, um, or any biomarkers is, is a question that we're trying to address. Um, and then, again, the issue of contamination, especially since it takes a while to uh, go to Mars and conversely bring a sample back. So thinking in terms of uh, how long a sample might be exposed to uh, potential contamination is something to think about as well. So these are the, the platforms, general platforms that you can use to look for life. And indeed, for Mars, that's basically what we've been doing for the last few decades. We started off with orbiters. We used those to target specific landing sites we thought might be interesting either from a geological or an astrobiological perspective. We sent landers or rovers there, and, and eventually we'll be moving to sample return. Now, with Mars, of course, it's, it's easier to do this. It's cheaper, right? It's the closest, closest neighbor we have. Uh, but in terms of thinking about icy worlds a lot further out, a lot of these uh, these types of strategies get to be more challenging, and we need to be thinking about what kind of technologies we can leverage to to make this more feasible in the future. Let's see. I'm I'm reading a few of the comments. Steve brought up a thought exercise about uh, a rover or a well-equipped person finding definitive signs of life in Earth's Atacama Desert. That's a a very good point. A lot of teams including one that I was a part of as a grad student, have tried to do that. Uh, we tried to take an instrument that's as close to what we would put on a rover and try to look for life. And one challenge that we found, especially with, with Mars, is sample handling. I mean, we're, we're just breaking the surface in terms of handling liquids in a place like Mars. I mean, there are very few experiments that even use uh, liquids or solvents. Let's see, there was the two Viking probes had... They, they essentially just had like a scoop and they dumped some some Mars soil, regolith, whatever you want to call it, in and then added some water and then looked at what kind of gases were evolved. And since then we've had, let's see, the Phoenix, the Mecca, it's a M, I don't remember the M, but electrochemical conductivity, I believe, or the E and the C for Mecca. And they basically did the same thing. They had these um, special cells that were, I think they were about yay big, dumped some soil in, and then added some water and measured conductivity and other properties. But it was still just sort of squirting water in, seeing what happened. Uh, the SAM instrument of Curiosity does something similar. They have some kind of package that they open that has particular solvents and reagents that are supposed to react with certain organics if they're present or other species. And then they look at the, the gases that are evolved. But I think in order for us to get to a point where we can do definitive life detection, and I'll get into this in a little bit later, that we need to be able to handle liquids much more precisely, maybe through microfluidics or something like that, so we can look to analyses like a PCR, um, DNA analyses, very, very specific amino acid assays, these kind of things that need liquid processing and sample handling more than just squirting water somewhere and then seeing what happens. It's a good first step, what we've done so far, but we need to, to think about advancing these kind of technologies, in, in my opinion, uh, to get better at addressing the life question. 
Let's see. Yeah, and Michael News bringing up a point to Max Coleman about that we're looking for trace biosignatures, and that's a very good point. Uh, I believe the Viking limit of detection for life was something on the order of 10 to the 6 or a million cells per gram of soil, I think, and someone can correct me if that's, that's not true. Uh, and really, realistically, we need to get down to the point where we can detect something like one bacterial cell per gram if we really want good limits of detection. So these are all good points to bring up and good things to be talking about. I'm going to keep moving, uh, but feel free to interrupt me if there are any points that we should talk about. Um, let's see. Okay, so what I, I did next was just brought up a couple of remote sensing and then on the next slide in situ techniques that have applications for astrobiology. Um, most that have been used before, but some that, that haven't yet been used, and I think it's important for us to talk about this. So for remote sensing, one of the most... Uh, uh, powerful techniques is imaging spectroscopy. It's also called hyperspectral imaging. And these spectrometers use typically sunlight as a light source, and they're measuring reflectance, so surface reflectance, based on what is absorbed, uh, depending on the orientation of the spacecraft, how much light you get back, you can determine uh, the mineral, and basically the composition of the surface. Most of these spectrometers operate in the UV to near IR, although you can get to thermal IR. It depends on how, how sensitive and how you select your detector. And this is relevant for life for a number of reasons. You can detect, for example, the red edge of chlorophyll. I think the best example of this was an experiment proposed by Carl Sagan, where uh, Galileo, the spacecraft that ended up going way, way out to study, um, to study Jupiter, as it was doing one of its uh, gravity assists, I think, swung by Earth, and at a distance of 1,000 kilometers, Carl Sagan asked the question, can we use our imaging spectrometers to look for life on Earth and see if we can find it? And they took spectra. They weren't able to discern any, uh, any physical structures. You know, like they say you can see the, um, the Great Wall of China from orbit, well, from 1,000 kilometers, I guess you can't with the resolution of the spectrometer on Galileo. But you could see the red edge of chlorophyll, right? Chlorophyll absorbs very strongly in the red. It reflects in the green, which is why grass and, and trees and things look green. So we could see that. Uh, we could detect signatures of, of certain gases that may be indicative of life. Uh, methane that doesn't hang around in the atmosphere long. It needs to have something continually producing it. That could be life. Um, ozone, things like that. So that's a very good example, and, and I'm so glad that Carl Sagan proposed that experiment because even in a place teeming with life like Earth, from 1,000 kilometers away, definitive detection of life isn't quite as straightforward as you think it would be. Uh, but imaging spectrometers are, are a great tool to use for looking for all of these, these spectroscopic signatures uh, of, of life or, or byproducts of life like methane release. Uh, another imaging, not imaging, but a, a spectrometer that can be used for life is gamma ray spectroscopy. And er, yeah, spec, yeah, did I say spectrometer? Spectroscopy. And these measure gamma ray distribution. This isn't good for planets or moons with atmospheres, so Titan and Mars are out. But places like Europa or Enceladus with uh, tenuous to no atmospheres, you can use this to map the elemental and atomic abundances over the entire surface. And this can be really informative, especially for a place, say, like Europa, that might have exchange of material from the, the ocean interior to the exterior periodically. And if we can pinpoint targeted areas where this might have happened recently by looking at elemental and isotopic abundances, uh, that could be informative for where we might send a landed mission. So gamma ray spectroscopy is good. Uh, radar is also helpful. Um, you can use radio frequency. I think uh, the Cassini radar mapper uses microwaves uh, to look to peer through Titan's atmosphere and do mapping of the surface. And you can use this to look for water. Obviously, ice versus water versus um, uh, very dense rocks reflect uh, in radio very differently. And so you can use this to, to pinpoint or confirm areas where you may have water. So that's another technique. Uh, let's now go to in situ. Now this is doesn't cover by any means all techniques for in situ life detection. There are 
a ton, but I just tried to, to group them into three major categories. The first one, of course, is microscopy. And depending on your optics, you can image things on the tens of microns to even submicron level, and you can look for evidence of either extinct or extant life. Extinct life, you could look for microfossils, things like stromatolites, which are, are um, uh, mat mats of microbial life that have been, been squished and compressed and fossilized over time. The image on the right here is an example of some stromatolites. So we can use, do that. You can also look for things like bacterial cells, so extant current life. And if you bring along your own excitation source and your own set of filters, you can even look at fluorescence. Uh, minerals do fluoresce, but they tend to be much more long-lived than life, which typically most organic molecules have fluorescence on the order of picoseconds to nanoseconds. Uh, most minerals fluoresce in, on the microsecond to millisecond scale. So if you have some type of, of way of discriminating between those, you could look for mineral fluorescence and then look for life uh, evidence, or at least evidence of organic molecules through fluorescence. So microscopy is, is pretty powerful. For molecular analyses, this is a big group. I just sort of lopped them all together. Essentially, you, you use some kind of separation technique, whether, <clears throat> excuse me, whether it's in the gas phase or liquid phase. So you either uh, desorb or, or you can use heating or, or moldy, some other type of, of laser desorption to get your sample into gas phase. And then you can separate it down a column uh, Alternatively, you can dissolve your sample in liquid, do some kind of extraction, and get things into the liquid phase, and then, again, do a separation based on size, charge, other properties, uh, interaction with the, the substrate of the column. And so you can separate the species you're interested in and then detect them either through something like mass spec. You can use contactless conductivity. You could tag these particular organics with um, a fluorescent dye and then use a fluorescence-based technique to measure them. And this is important because you can identify specific molecules. For example, if you were targeting amino acids or ATP or sugars, evidence of life, excuse me. Um, or if you have a really good mass spec, you can do isotopic ratios. So you can look at carbon-12, carbon-13 kind of things to see if, um, even if you have organic compounds, if they've been around a while or if they're relative, relatively recent. Uh, and I've just touched on a few of those types of analyses, but just to give you an idea of what's out there. Um, and then the last category, which is yet to be applied for life detection elsewhere, like Mars, but has a lot of potential, is amino assays. So this is targeting specific molecules using antibodies. This is where you would need, like I mentioned before, some of that uh, fluidic handling capability, where you can't just squirt liquid somewhere and then call it good. You would need to uh, do very, very careful treatments of life or of, of the sample in order to look for life. Uh, for example, real-time PCR can be done in very small devices. Uh, they're getting smaller and smaller, but have yet to be applied to planetary science and looking for things in places like Mars. So these techniques have advantages because you can look for very specific proteins. You could discriminate between <clears throat> L and D amino acids, which has been considered the smoking gun for looking for life that evolved very differently from ours. Um, I hope everyone's familiar with the fact that the, all life on Earth uses the, the L enantiomer of amino acids. But there's no reason why we couldn't use D. We just had to evolve one way or the other because... Um, from a mass and charge standpoint, they look exactly the same, but they're not superimposable, and so uh, proteins, when they fold, won't interact the same way. Likewise, we use, I believe, D-rotated, so dextrorotatory, the other type of enantiomer of sugars. So if we find life, say, on Mars or somewhere else that uses the opposite enantiomer of amino acid or sugar, that could be a very, very strong case for life that evolved differently from that on Earth. But when you do immuno, immuno assays, you're limiting yourself uh, to unless you're you have amino acid or antibodies that are specific for like the D amino acid. But normally they're they're specific for Earth life, so life as we know it, which is fine. I mean, looking for DNA, looking for proteins, life as we know it is good. But maybe we should expand outside of those um, those sort of blinder type life investigations, too. Uh, someone has a question about culturing. Culturing is challenging enough to
to do on Earth in a lot of ways. It'd be it'd be fun to to do that thought experiment to see if we could do that on a place like Mars. Um, I have a friend who's a microbiologist, and I was talking to her the other day, and there are organisms that are present in in ocean water on Earth that are incredibly abundant. But because we hadn't de- developed the right kind of, of agarose or the right kind of nutrient supply for them to grow on, they weren't cultured in the laboratory for decades. We didn't even know they existed because we had biased ourselves to looking for different organisms. And I fear that we may encounter something similar uh, when we're looking for life in an extreme environment like Mars. You have to tailor the selection or the, the, um, the detection technique to what you think has to be there, but because you're thinking about what has to be there, you're sort of biasing yourself. This is a very good conversation to have. These are things that we need to be talking about and discussing as we move forward and try to think about the best techniques, the techniques that have the best chance, at least, of looking, of detecting life. Okay, so these are just a few challenges that I I was thinking about, not necessarily for a particular technique, uh, nothing inherent to one technique, but just sort of more in general. Uh, for example, detection in in soil or regolith. Oh, a couple of my images didn't copy. Oh, well. Uh, for example, extraction efficiency is not that good in soil. Soil tends to be a very porous. Uh, the regolith on Mars is most likely the same way, especially considering how electrostatically charged it is, how it likes to cling to things. Uh, it's really good at trapping organic molecules in the the matrix of the soil, and it's very tough to get them back out. Uh, typical extraction efficiencies on Earth, if you're getting 10%, that's considered pretty good, which is kind of disappointing, um, but there are plenty of extraction protocols that a lot of scientists, both at NASA and universities, are working on to try to address this problem. There's subcritical water extraction, using various solvents, all sorts of things, but it's a serious problem that we've been working on and that we need to continue to work on. Another problem, especially in a place like Mars, is that as soon as you add water to this soil, uh, things start to happen. The stuff that was was dry and unreacted before is now in an environment where it can start to, say, chew up organics, like uh, what might be happening with all the perchlorates in the Mars um, soil. You can have potentially, let's say, a acid, very acidic compounds, like might be present on Europa's surface. If you have um, a lot of sulfates, you could have sulfuric acid-derived compounds that as soon as you add liquid water, it can chew up whatever you're trying to detect. So we have to think very carefully about how the intrinsic environment will affect the sample before we even get to analyze it. So that's that's one point. Uh, For Titan, this has been a bit of a problem. We've made these simulated Titan aerosols on Earth. So you take methane and nitrogen, essentially Titan atmosphere, you expose it to energy, and you get this brown, gunky stuff. And I have an image of this on the right. These are some tholins that were uh, actually made in the lab of Vishankare, who passed away recently. But he did some of the the initial work with Carl Sagan on these, and they were the ones who came up with the name tholin. Excuse me. It actually means... um, uh, it comes from the Greek word tholos, which means muddy or not clear, which totally has a double meaning, right? Because muddy, they're, they're sort of brownish like mud, but they're also not clear because we don't know what they're made of. So love Carl Sagan. This is awesome. Uh, but, okay, so we have these solins on Titan there at 90 Kelvin, right, on the surface. It's minus 180-something degrees Celsius, really cold. If you warm these up just to room temperature, their composition changes. We can see changes in the, the IR absorption spectra, for example. Uh, and when they're exposed to liquid water, they change even more. So how do you interrogate such a complex sample without changing it? Uh, it's been a big challenge, and that's something we're still trying to address, even using these simulated aerosols that might be very different from what's present on Titan, but we're pretty sure they're kind of close. Okay, let's see what else. Uh, radiation on Europa. On the surface of Europa, a human would get a lethal dose within somewhere along 5 to 20 minutes, depending on who you talk to. And we've discussed this radiation environment in terms of electronics, but when we're talking about life detection, if we want to bring along, say, an immunoassay or something like that, how is this going to affect, how is the radiation going to affect this experiment? Uh, things like that that we need to consider also. And then finally, on a place like Enceladus, 
uh, sure, it's it's spewing out sample. All we have to do is go and get it. Seems very simple, right? But not really, especially when you consider that most spacecraft flybys, they're they're qualified on the order of kilometers per second. It's really fast. And so if you're flying through this this shower of of icy crystalline particles that have been spewed out of Enceladus's south pole. Um, you're going to be encountering those at tremendous speeds. And how do you capture them? How do you collect them in a way where they're not just going to kind of explode into individual monomers or have some type of, of chemically re related tribal chemical reaction where it's just based on their impact, they, they form something else that wasn't there originally? Things like that are important to think about. Uh, let's see. Oh, and I have this is my last slide. This Doing a lot of reflection uh, for this talk, I was thinking about what the future of life detection technologies could mean. And NASA has, has constantly adopted this mantra of failure is not an option. And for flagship missions, for human-based exploration, of course, that's, that's what we should focus on. But when it comes to trying out new technologies for astrobiology, for pushing the boundaries of, of our, our capabilities in te technology, in engineering, in, in science, being able to, to get these limits of detection to a place where we can be confident that we're actually looking for life, that we, we're sure that we've found it or not. I think that's the wrong strategy, the failure is an option. I think we should go back to the, the beginning of JPL when we could take risks. We could operate things that were high risk, low cost, but we learned a lot from them. And I think learning more about a technique, whether it'll work or not, whether um, whether it's feasible, and realizing that early on and not investing a whole lot in that and investing in something else that has a lot more potential, it might make more sense. And granted, uh, the planetary protection folks might not be too excited about us trying to send, say, a fleet of CubeSats to Mars, uh, trying out a whole bunch of different techniques all over, but something like that. I could envision might be a, a realistic future of doing the, this smaller missions, maybe sending a fleet of instruments in, in different spacecraft instead of just one one landed platform. So if you lose a couple, it's not a big deal because you've got five more. That kind of thing might be something that we should talk about. Um, and I think that's all I had. Yeah, so I'd like to, to open up the floor for questions. Thanks, Morgan. Um, just so we're clear, I, I suspect everybody has been through enough of these webinars now to know the process, but the audio lines are open if you want to speak. Um, if we find it, people are crashing over each other, you can certainly use the little raise your hand button uh, at the top, and equally, feel free to, um, uh, to uh, type straight into the text box. And Morgan, as you can see, Mike is just asking whether you want to bring any of your polls back. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I, I had a couple others that I didn't get a chance to talk about because I got distracted. Um, it happens sometimes when I get excited about stuff. Okay, so Mike, do you want to bring up the, let's see, actually the third one, the third question would be something I think that could incite some discussion. So, and someone brought this up in the in the open chat forum about looking for extant versus extinct life. Um, obviously, there are different biosignatures we could focus on. Um, extinct life includes things like the microfossils, the stromatolites, certain chemical signatures, things like hopanoids or sterols that um, are chemically modified from things that were originally present in cells but can be good indicators that life existed there in the past. That versus the extant life, so looking for you know, a actively produced amino acids, DNA, RNA, um, ATP, so the energy molecules, things like that. It uh, looks like, yes, I agree. Uh, we should be looking for both. Uh, but it depends a lot on the environment, right? I mean, let's say Mars, of course, we want to look more in the regolith for microfossils and things like that. But what about the poles of Mars, places where some of these other organics might have been preserved for extended periods of time? I mean, bacterial spores can hang around for uh, potentially hundreds of millions of years. There's a, a study out that found spores and halite crystals on Earth. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hang on. Um, halite crystals on Earth that I believe the halite crystals were something on the order of 100 million years old, and there were um, bacterial spores trapped inside that then they could culture and make growing metabolizing cells out of those. It's a bit controversial because we're not sure if the spores were 
trapped in there when the halite crystal is formed or if they were introduced later. But in theory, there's nothing to limit uh, something like a bacterial spore from hanging around that long, which means that it would, can, it would have a lot of its organic um, compounds still present. Things like uh, dipicolinic acid, DNA, nucleic acids, um, some of the, the phospholipid fatty acids are things that, that um, comprise the bacterial spore coat, stuff like that. So, yeah, I, I agree that both is important, but it depends a lot on where you go. Let's see, PLFA, does anyone need a definition of PLFA, phospholipid fatty acids? And again, a lot of the things I've brought up are, are just touching on the surface of a few of these techniques. I didn't want to get too in-depth. There are so many, and they're advancing so quickly. It would take a long, long time to do that thorough literature search to find them all. <laughs> does anyone have any comments they'd like to say um, on the phone line? Uh, the only conclusive evidence, Steve said, will be a body <laughs> dead or alive. Hopefully a, a cell <laughs> is what you're talking about. Yeah, I agree. I also <laughs> think... I wasn't talking about that kind of sacrifice. I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to be challenging, right, to convince not just the science community here, but everyone in general that we've really found something. Okay, life, life is one thing. Life is exciting for us, but extraterrestrial life, life that we can prove evolved separately from life on Earth. I think that's that's incredibly exciting, right? How do we prove that? Well, I mean, ultimately the only way to do that, assuming that it's similar to life on Earth, would be DNA, right? Proving that it branched off much, much earlier than, than our life did. I know, can anyone else think of something that we could we could use to clearly distinguish and of course, Chris McKay's whole L versus D amino acid thing. There's that too. But looking, we're still trying to develop very small, compact, portable ways to discriminate between um, enantiomers of amino acids. So I think there's a lot of room for advancement there, and I hope that technology gets uh, gets invested in uh, for future Mars and related investigations. It'd be so much fun to see a cell like bring a, a really nice microscope to Mars or Enceladus or Europa and then find a cell, just boom, right there. It'd be awesome. <laughs> um, whilst people are thinking about their questions, let me just mention that uh, the document that this presentation is based on is linked to on the front of the website, and it's now being flipped over so that everyone can make comments on it. You're not editing the document directly, you're just adding your comments to any parts of that. So uh, whilst the conversation in the chat log is extremely useful and on the phone lines, uh, it's also really helpful to the authors if you can go to the document and just add thoughts, references, questions directly in that to help them uh, strengthen the document as well. Oh, I totally forgot to talk about one thing. Okay, so there's, there's one other uh, thing, and Lindsay just brought up something that, that reminded me about this. So when you're talking about uh, biotic versus abiotic, uh, typically when you have abiotic production of, say, a suite of organic compounds like amino acids, uh, they tend to be produced in sort of a, um, a very broad sense. There's no specificity. So you'll get a, a whole slew of organics that are all kind of very similar. Let's take, let's take fatty acids. This is a good example. So we found fatty acids in meteorites. Um, so fatty acids are they're sim similar to phospholipid fatty acids, but you just cut off the phospholipid part. So you've got a long aliphatic chain, lots of carbons, and then at the end you have a carboxylic acid. And these can hang around for a while, and we found plenty of these in meteorites uh, up to a carbon length of C30. Now your cells in your body, bacterial cells, typically use carbon link chains of those fatty acids of like 16 or 18. Um, but they, they do them very specifically. So you'll see, for example, if you have life, you'll see a huge spike of C16, 16 carbons long, and C18 and C20. Uh, you don't tend to see many of the C19 and C21s because it turns out that the way life makes these fatty acids, they make them where they add on the carbons in sets of two. So one of the things that we can do when we're looking for signatures of life is not just look for fatty acids, but look for patterns. Do we see in these meteorites, if it's abiotic, we'll see all the way from carbon, say, 10 to 30, and we'll sort of see an even distribution of all of them. 
But if it was from life, we might see these spikes at C18, at C20, at C22, I think, is fungus, stuff like that. Um, and we can trace those back to particular kinds of life, too. That's another story. But the point is to look for, for asymmetric distributions, to look for spikes of things that if it was produced abiotically, you wouldn't expect to see. So looking for a whole suite of compounds is important, and looking for their distributions uh, relative to each other is really important. So detection and quantitation, we've got to find out how much of the stuff is there, can help us a lot in this discriminating between uh, biotic and abiotic. Let's see, I'm going to just look at a few of the comments here. Um, okay, right, this is a good point, the radiation issue on Mars. So the atmosphere of Mars is thin, we end up sterilizing the first it looks like a meter or two. Oh, I was hoping it was centimeters. Okay, we end up sterilizing a lot of the topsoil, right, because of UV radiation and things. So if we want to find life, yes, I agree. We have to drill the, um, the InSight in mission, which is a lander that um, is going to Mars. can't remember what year. Maybe Steve can help me out soon. We're going to drill down two meters, and that will be our first test of a, a drill that can approach those types of magnitudes. It'd be so much fun to put an organic experiment on the end of that drill, but right now they're doing just proof of concept. I think they're going to look for the planting sensors and looking for um, for geology. Oh, ExoMars is a two-meter drill. I did not know that. Thank you, Polly. <laughs> you can say, Polly, do you want to come on the line and say a little bit about the ExoMars mission? or someone else who knows a bit more about ExoMars. I'm afraid I, the only uh, instrument package I'm familiar with for ExoMars is that uh, life marker chip that looks pretty exciting. It's got some antibodies that they're targeting for a whole bunch of different organic molecules, including hopanes, I think, or hopanoids, one of those extinct life biomarkers. Oh, poor Mike. Okay, no worries, Polly. Maybe you can make some comments on the uh, the Word documents that Andy mentioned. That would be really helpful for us. We don't want to miss anything. Cool. Thanks. Steve, do you want to chime in on any of these upcoming missions and the issue with radiation on Mars and sterilization, looking for life deeper down? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, thanks, by the way, Morgan, for this really nice presentation. I think you um, gave a real or nicely organized uh, presentation. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm pasting in a comment here, which has been my, my mode of communication so far. Um, oh. Yeah, yeah, so so for, for Europa, at least in terms of the ra the radiation, um, just below the surface, you might find pristine material. Um, if, if you need to get into the ocean, that's a, that's a different problem in that you're talking about kilometers of ice. That's why I think the, the putative finding of plumes from Europa is particularly exciting. Uh, and of course that's yes, one reason why that. plume yeah, that's one reason why plumes on Enceladus are, are really exciting as well. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I do have a question, yeah. Steve. I heard uh, from a, a mechanistic standpoint that because it's so cold on Europa, the hardness of the ice on the surface is on the order of granite on Earth. So even ten centimeters getting that far in could be a challenge. Do you know of any any drill or other types of mechanical proposals that have gone in to, to try to get down below that? Um, well, so, so the, the Europa Lander concept uh, that was published in Astrobiology recently included a drill, and that was based on the, the sorry, the Phoenix drill, is that right? Um, but I, it, in those discussions, it wasn't seen as a problem getting through cold ice. So it's not, okay. not an intractable problem. Okay, excellent. That's good to hear. What about, oh boy, you'd have to be, how would you, so as soon as you expose that to the radiation environment, you've got to collect those organics really fast or do something, ooh. And so there was a specific protocol, again, described in the paper for uh, collecting the material in such a way that you didn't compromise your sample. And that included, because there was a, a GCMS on the, the model payload, uh, that included melting it in such a way that you didn't, um, mix different portions of the drilled sample. That is the, okay. the upper the upper portion that was radiated. So you you want to sample both and compare them. Right. 
Right, interesting. Cool. Okay. Uh, let's see. Any other comments? Shouldn't have to dig too far. Oh, Michael New hosted a workshop. Yeah, that's another thing, guys. If you have links, like Steve, if you could look up the that astrobiology paper and put a link either here or in the, the Word document. And similarly with this, this workshop that Michael New hosted, if we could put links for that, that would be really nice so then we can all kind of be on the same page. Ooh, thank you, Polly. I think I might have read that paper. I did a lot of literature searches in the past few days um, just trying to to get a more broader scope idea uh, when I was preparing this talk, and I think I, I might have skimmed that one. I'll go back and check. So thank you for that. Polly uh, brought up a, a paper. Oh, we just... Hey, Morgan? Okay. Yes. Hello? Hi. This is Mary Wojtek. Um, the the report that Lindsay was referring to was a report out from a workshop that we held in August, and actually it's not out yet, so um, oh. I'm not sure what stage it's in, but um, there's a resource there to be had um, with that we should consider if you're going to have any kind of discussion about technology needs or um, accessing important environments. Great. Okay, thanks. Well, can you uh, let us know when that does come out? Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to scroll up and just see if there are any other questions uh, that we haven't addressed yet. And I did have one more poll, although it's kind of kind of obvious, but maybe, Mike, we could bring up that question number two about the, yeah. So just for, for you personally, what would be necessary to convince you that we'd found life somewhere else? Would you be okay with us just saying, let's say we had an orbiting spacecraft and we saw a definitive release of methane that, at least to our best understanding, couldn't be explained by geology. That's just an example. Would that be enough to convince you? Or would you need some kind of in situ detection as long as we could confidently say it wasn't from contamination if we found some example of, of extant life or extinct life? That I just gave one example there. Or would you really need sample re return to Earth where we could fully uh, analyze the, the heck out of the sample with all of our really, really um, you know, ultra-sensitive and, and best of the best techniques? What would you need to definitively say that you found life? Okay, that's interesting. See, I would have voted for the sample return to Earth for the truly ultimate, like, we absolutely have found life. Not only have we found it, but we can show you when it branched off from life on Earth, that kind of thing. That's interesting. Cool, good. That means we don't need to invest too much in sample return. We should focus more on in situ detection. I'm more excited about that because sample return is expensive. Can you guys see me? I had to restart my webcam and Mike sent a note, but it's not we, time stamped. Yep. Okay. Just checking. So we're into our last just a few minutes of the webinar. Um, are there any last questions that people want to raise? If you're on the phone line and you want to talk, that's great. And if not, just um, <laughs> just in the uh, text chat. Give people a moment to ponder deeply. Yeah, this is one of those questions that I think motivated most of us to get into this kind of research. Is are we alone, and could there be life somewhere else? And um, Jonathan Munin, I think uh, I had a discussion with him a few months ago, and we were talking about how on a place like Earth, everywhere you look for life, you find it. It's ubiquitous, right? And, and you look at the bottom of the ocean, you look in Antarctica, everywhere we find life. And so why don't we see this anywhere else? I mean, there are organisms that could survive, um, granted not on the surface of Europa or the surface of Mars, but probably pretty close to a point where if life were ubiquitous, would we see signs? And so that's another very interesting question of if there is life somewhere else, why is it not ubiquitous like it would be like it is on Earth? Um, could it be that it's evolved more slowly? Could it be that it's migrated down underground? Maybe on Mars, this could be a, an example of that. Uh, and will we find 
ubiquitous life somewhere else. All of these these um, exoplanet observations with our, our better and better, more improving telescopes are really, really exciting from this aspect. So I believe that we will find life somewhere else in our lifetime. I really do, especially if we keep advancing the way we are. And that's it's a pretty awesome time to be alive. <laughs> So perhaps that can be our closing comment. Um, Morgan, thank you very much. Uh, just to remind everyone, um, please go and uh, add any thoughts you've got to the, the paper. Um, you'll also find on the front of the website um, the yesterday's paper, is the, the link on the first two links are there. So if you didn't have a chance, please go and uh, pop your comments in there. And with that, Thank you very much. Hope to see you all next week for our next two webinars. Cheerio. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Stay curious. <laughs>